Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki So we're, we're scheduled to speak on the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 4. About the, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, you're not hearing me. Oh, my goodness. Let me see. Where's the mic? Okay, wait, the mic is mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we're scheduled to speak on Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 4, the appearance of Sri Narad. Right? But before we do that, I would like to read to you a passage from the purport of the last verse of the third chapter. In the third chapter, do you remember, Krishna had been speaking about, or, or rather, Sutta Goswami had been describing the different incarnations of the Lord. And then we hear about, uh, we hear Sutta Goswami speaking. Sutta Goswami is describing how he came to know how he came to be, how he, what he's describing his qualification to speak this knowledge. So at the end of the purport of the last verse of the third chapter, Prabhupada has written a very important point. I want to read it to you. Everybody hearing okay? Okay. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, listen carefully. Prabhupada writes, the secret of knowing the Bhagavatam is mentioned... Uh, you cannot hear. I can hear. Yeah, I can hear. I can hear. Who is doing the offering? <laughs> Yeah, maybe you could ask him not to ring the bell while we're speaking. Can, can you all mute the microphones? Yeah, you should mute, mute your microphones until, you know, I'll speak now. And then afterwards you can, when you want to say something, you can open your mic. Okay, so I'm going to read this very important passage from the last verse from the purport. Prabhupada writes, the secret of knowing the Bhagavatam is mentioned here. No one can give rapt attention who is not pure in mind. Right? If we're not able to pay attention to hear this Srimad Bhagavatam, the problem is we're not pure in mind. Then Prabhupada goes on, no one can be pure in mind who is not pure in action. We, no one can be pure in action who is not pure in eating, sleeping, fearing and mating. But somehow or other, if someone hears with rapt attention from the right person at the very beginning one can assuredly see Lord Sri Krishna in person in the pages of the Bhagavatam. So this is a very important statement Prabhupada is making. He's describing to us the importance of reading Srimad Bhagavatam. And when we study the Srimad Bhagavatam with full attention, then we will see Krishna in person, in the pages of the Bhagavatam. I know you, you all want to see Krishna, right? You want to see Krishna. You know Krishna is very attractive. He's Bhagavan. He's very famous. He's a very wonderful personality. So we can see him in the pages of the Bhagavatam. So that's an important point. You want to remember this statement which is there. 
So we're going to the fourth chapter now, and the fourth chapter begins. Srila Vyasa Dev is speaking. On hearing Sutta Goswami speak thus, Sonaka Muni, who was the elder leader of all the rishis engaged in that prolonged sacrificial ceremony, congratulated Sutta Goswami and addressed him as follows. All right, so Shonaka Muni. Shonaka Muni is, Shonaka Muni is a great sage. He's the head of all the other sages who have come there in Naimisharanya, who have gathered there in Naimisharanya, many thousands of them. I can't remember exactly how many thousands, but a very big number of great sages had all gathered there because they knew Kali Yuga is beginning. So they would come there to perform sacrifice. And Shonaka Muni was selected as the leader. And the, the, the function of the leader is to put questions and to represent the mood of all these assembled sages who would come there. And of course they would selected Sutta Goswami to speak to them. So they had heard with the first two chap at chapter two and chapter three, Sutta Goswami was speaking, and he was describing the process of devotional service, and he was also explaining, describing the different important incarnations of Lord Krishna, and he described also how Lord Krishna is the the source of all the incarnations. He's not an avatar himself but he's the origin of all the avatars. So Sutta Goswami had described that he was going to speak the Srimad Bhagavatam. He was happy to speak the Srimad Bhagavatam. Guru Maharaj, we can't hear you. Oh my God. What's going on now? It went off again. I can't hear also. Yeah, I see. Okay, you can hear. Oh. Hare Krishna. You can hear. How is it now? Yes, yes, Guru Maharaj. Going off and on, I don't know. Okay, just tell me every time when it goes off and I'll have to click it back on. So Sutta Goswami is being appreciated by Shona Kamuni. Shona Kamuni understands that Sutta Goswami is the right person to speak to them, the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, when Sukadeva Goswami spoke it to Maharaj Parikshit. So he had been present there at that time. So that was one of his qualifications. He had many other qualifications. Of course, his father was Ramaharshan Sutta, and his father had been removed by Lord Balaram. But when Ramaharshan was removed by Lord Balaram, Lord Balaram benedicted Sutta Goswami that as the son he would inherit the benedictions which had been given initially to the father. In other words, he would have a long life and he would be undisturbed by any bodily ailments and he would be able to speak the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is important. The speaker has to be qualified. And the audience also have to be qualified. This point was made also in the first chapter of the first canto. They were explaining how the speaker has to be qualified. He has to know the subject. Be able to explain it so that the audience can understand. Srila Prabhupada was very expert in that. That was Srila Prabhupada's great qualification that he could present the most complex, the most deep philosophical things in a simple manner so that people, laymen or neophytes or people, novices in devotional service, they could all understand the most difficult, complex things. Srimad Bhagavatam, 
is the highest. It's the ripened fruit of the Vedas. So Srila Prabhupada wanted to present this Srimad Bhagavatam for people all over the world. So he had to do it in a manner which it could be understood. You know, other people, they write books and people just spend their whole life trying to understand what they're saying. But Srila Prabhupada's books are not like that. If we read Srila Prabhupada's books carefully, we can understand very clearly what he is saying. So, Sonaka, Sonaka Muni is telling Sutta Goswami what he wants to hear. He is telling, he is asking Sutta Goswami, he said, we want to know, uh, we want to know why did Srila Vyasadev write this book? What was the circumstances behind it. Where did he get the inspiration for this, to, to write this book? And when did he write it? And at what place did he begin it? Why did he, why did he begin to do this? Because it's not a small book. Many slokas, they say 18,000 slokas in the Bhagavatam. So, to compose one sloka, it takes some time, it requires thought and so on. So, it must have taken Srila Vyasadeva some time to compose this Srimad Bhagavatam. So, Shonika, he wants to know everything about the Srimad Bhagavatam. He wants to know what's behind it all. Why was it spoken? Then he, he wants to know also, he said, Srila Vyasadeva's son, meaning Sukadeva Goswami, he was a, a monist. In other words, he was absorbed in Brahman. He was not actually initially absorbed in devotional service, but he was a, he was a monist. He was concentrated on Brahman. And also, he appeared like an ignorant person Sukadeva Goswami appeared to be a madman in some ways because he would walk everywhere naked and his body was dirty often and hair all over the place and people saw him and thought he must be insane. They didn't take him seriously. No one understood his spiritual position. And Sutta uh, Sonaka gives an example. He, he talks about how Sukadeva Goswami proved his transcendental situation that on one occasion, after he was, when he left home, his father was coming after him. Srila Vyasadeva was following behind Sukadeva Goswami because Srila Vyasadeva wanted to initiate him, he wanted to give him the sacred thread, to make him a brahmana, to make him a twice-born. But Sukadeva Goswami didn't care for any of these things. He, was, he just left, he just left home. So Srila Vyasadeva came after him to try to bring him back. So Sutta Goswami, desc uh, rather Shonika describes here, he heard the pastime, he said that when Sukadeva Goswami was going, he came past a lake and young ladies were bathing there. But the young ladies, when they saw Sukadeva Goswami, they didn't, they didn't worry about him because they saw that he did not make any distinction between male or female. He was fully situated on the transcendental platform. But when Srila Vyasadeva came by, then the girls, the young women, they all rushed to cover their bodies, to get clothing. They didn't want to appear naked in front of Vyasadeva. So Vyasadeva was surprised how this could happen. And he questioned the young girls. And the young girls explained that that young boy, your son, 
he, he did not make any distinction. He did not see any difference between us and him. But you, we can see you make a distinction. Of course, Srila Vyasadev was a Grihasta. And Prabhupada explains, it's the duty of the Grihasta to make distinction between men and women. You cannot be a Grihasta and be on the transcendental platform like that, fully absorbed in transcendence. If somebody is on that position, they don't need to stay a Grihasta. They can leave the family life. But one in householder life will make a distinction. And Prabhupada writes there that as long as such a distinction is there, one should not try to become a sannyasi like Sukadeva Goswami. At least the theoretically. One must be convinced that a living entity is neither male nor female. Right. The body is just the dress of the soul. So the liberated persons, they don't make any distinction. They don't distinguish between the male and the female. So th that's, that was Sukadeva Goswami's position. He was revealing his transcendental nature. And it doesn't minimize the position of Srila Vyasadeva. Srila Vyasadeva was also a transcendentalist. But because he was a householder, so he, he, he cannot be like Sukadeva Goswami. So there's a difference according to the situation, the ashram. Although transcendentally they're both great souls and on the highest platform, but there's a difference in their behavior. One is a brahmachari and one is a grihasta. They will certainly behave differently. The one who is a brahmachari should not condemn the grihasta. They shouldn't make, they shouldn't think anything less of them. We have to understand this point. So Sukadeva Goswami was an avaduta actually. He was avadut. Avadut means one who does not belong to any one ashram. He is fully transcendent. We, are, we can say also Lord Nityananda was also avadut. They're not brahmachari, not gehasta, not vanapras, not sannyas. They're, they're avaduta. They're on the transcendental platform. And then pr the Prabhupada then it goes on to describe how Sukadeva Goswami would go to visit householders' homes. And his purpose in going to their home, externally it appeared to beg something, to beg some food or to beg some little milk for himself. But his real purpose in going to their home was not just simply to get some food, but his real purpose was in going to their home was to give them, to give those people in family life, to give them some spiritual knowledge, to give them some blessing, to let them hear some transcendental sound vibration. So it's important to understand the, how to associate with sadhus, because here is Sukadeva Goswami, naked, looking like a madman, but don't try to associate with just his appearance. We have to hear from him. It's important to hear from the, the devotees. We don't recognize someone just by their external appearance. We have to hear. And it's also important to understand that those people who are in the renounced order of life, that when they approach people in family life, they should never be attracted by their material situation. Just like we may go to the home of some wealthy people and we may see they have so much opulence and comfortable living and eating nice foods and so on. But we should never, a, a, one who is genuinely renounced should not feel attracted to these things. 
that would be very bad. So Sukadeva Goswami was never attracted to the material situation of the ordinary grihastha life. So Sonika Rishi wants to know also, he wants to know how, what happened that Maharaj Parikshit was ready to uh, give up everything and just sit down and hear the Bhagavatam. That this Maharaj Parikshit was in such a big position as the emperor of the world and he gave up everything very suddenly, while he was not very old, while he was still quite young, he left everything and he went to associate with the saintly persons and fasted till he gave up his life. So Sonika wants to hear about this, he wants to understand what happened, what were the circumstances which caused Maharaj Parikshit to do all that. He wants to know also about the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. He wants to hear about his wonderful activities, qualities. So later in Srimad Bhagavatam we'll hear how Maharaj Parikshit ruled the earth and how he chastised the personality of Kali. Whenever he's, when he saw someone about to kill a cow, then he immediately was ready to punish them. So in that section of Bhagavatam, Prabhupada writes, to kill the cow means to end human civilization. It's an, a very powerful statement, to end human civilization. And we can see right now at this particular time, human civilization is very much threatened by this deadly virus which is spreading everywhere. And this could also be one of the reactions due to the ill treatment of the cows. Because we have take, made so much abuse of the cows, so the reactions come in these kind of ways. Prabhupada says, Maharaj Parikshit wanted to protect the cow. But the personality of Kali, his intention is to kill it. So, Sonika wants to know more about Maharaj Parikshit, how he was preparing for death. He was a great emperor, he had so much opulence, he was very powerful, coming as the grandson of Arjuna. Why did he give up everything and go to the bank of the Ganges and fast? Maharaj Parikshit, after being cursed, of course, he gave up everything, he gave up eating and drinking and sleeping and he simply sat and heard Srimad Bhagavatam. And of course it was arranged that Sukadeva Goswami would come and speak to him. So he was such a great emperor, all his enemies would come and they would surrender to him and they would give their wealth to him. He was so powerful, he possessed so much opulence, but still he could give up everything and he could even give up his own life. So definitely this is something which wants to be understood clearly and Sonika asked Sutta Goswami, you please tell us about all this, we want to understand this, how, why all this happened? Uh, so Maharaj Parikshit was not ruling the kingdom for his own sense gratification. He was free of all attachment. So how could he give up his body when his body was doing so much good for others because he was giving shelter to everyone. He wasn't only protecting the cows, everyone in his kingdom, everyone in the kingdom was protected welfare, the development, their happiness, every, everything was being provided. So Shonika 
tells, he, he's speaking to Sutta Goswami and he said, I know you are expert in the meaning of these subjects, you know all of these things, so you can clearly explain it to us. He says also, I, I can understand there may be some portions of the Vedas which you don't know, but you know, the, you know, the, the, you know everything about the Puranas. And these subject matters are all explained. So we would like to hear from you. So Prabhupada explains in the purport here the difference between the Vedas and the Puranas. That there are Brahmanas and Paribrakacharyas. Paribrajakacharyas. So Paribrajakacharyas, they are preachers. They are speaking the message of the, Bhag of the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, the scriptures. And the Brahmanas, they are reciting Vedic mantras. So somebody may not be a very good Brahmana, may not be able to recite perfectly different slokas. The meter of the different Vedic hymns is very difficult. But these things can, can be learned with proper training. So. The, the, this simply being trained in these things is one thing, but Sutta Goswami is more important because he is going to give his realization of the different subjects. It's not that he's just repeating everything he's heard, it's not just like a parrot will recite. You may teach a parrot to recite the Maha Mantra. But at the time of death, he will not recite the Maha Mantra. The parrot doesn't have any realization. So it's important we want to try to develop realization, understanding, to un appreciate what is actually taking place here. We should understand the Srimad Bhagavatam is not simply some mythological events, some stories, fairy tales. It, these are events which actually happened. It is history which is being described. So we want you all to understand that these are events which actually took place in the past. And it's very important for us to hear about them because they have an important influence on our life today as we will hear, that these events all took place just at the beginning or just at the end of the previous yuga, just as Kali Yuga is beginning. And we're going to hear what happened, how Srila Vyasadeva appears and he, he saw the situation in the world today and well, Sutta Goswami is describing about Srila Vyasadeva. Uh, he's been questioned in this way, so he wants to reply. So he begins speaking about Srila Vyasadeva, how Srila Vyasadeva was, reside, he was residing in his ashram, Badarik ashram, in the Himalayas. So he had a, a place there. He was a you know, a renounced personality, although he was a householder. He was in a place called Samyaprash in Badarik Ashram. Samyaprash. Badarik Ashram, way up in the Himalayas. When, uh, when we come to Akshaya Tritya, from Akshaya Tritya, they will open the road up to the Himalayas. And at that time, you can go to Badarik Ashram. At the present moment, the road is not open. The road is closed all winter, and they open on the day of Akshaya Tritya. And then you can go up to Badarik Ashram, and you could see even Samya Prash. You can see these places. Actually, it said, Srila Vyasadeva is there, but you, you may not find him. Madhva Acharya went there. He could find it. But he's very pure. He was a great soul. Not everyone who goes to Badarik Ashram to find him. And so Badarik Ashram, Dhruva Maharaj had also gone there. 
when Dhruva Maharaj retired from ruling the earth, he also retired to Badarik Ashram. This was a very special place, very holy place. So Srila Vyasadeva was living there and he was re reflecting on the situation on the planet. Because he had been writing his books, he had written the Mahabharata, which described the history of the planet and the battle of Kurukshetra. Within Mahabharata is Bhagavad Gita. So Srila Vyasadeva wrote that Mahabharata for the less intelligent people because he knew less intelligent people, they won't understand the Vedas. The Vedas traditionally were only for the Brahmanas. Now who is a Brahmana? Who is actually qualified to read the Vedas? That is a controversial thing. Who is actually the Brahmana? Those who are Brahmanas by birth, they say birth is a qualification. But we learn from Acharyas, like our own founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, he tells us birth is not the qualification. The important qualification is that one has to, ha one has to cultivate the qualities of the Brahmana. So Srila Vyasadeva saw the problems in the world. He saw that generally people lack the quality of goodness. That is very significant. The importance of cultivating the quality of goodness cannot be emphasized enough. We often see how modern times we're very much influenced by and this passion and ignorance reflects in our behavior, particularly in our way of speaking. We speak very harshly and unkindly. We use vulgar language, words which are very unpleasant and painful. These are all signs of the mode of passion and ignorance. Krishna consciousness is to cultivate the mode of goodness. Srila Vyasadeva saw, due to the age of Kali, people had not only become godless and irreligious, but they lacked the mode of goodness. Very little qualities of goodness were there. And the lack of goodness reflected in their behavior, not only in their speaking, but in their actions, that they're very impatient. They want everything very quickly. We can see how much we're influenced by passion. We like to go high speed everywhere. When we get behind the wheel, we want to put our foot down on the accelerator. We'll go as fast as we can. You know, we like high speed. High, just like even food, and you know, fast food. All of these things reflect the mode of passion and ignorance. So Srila Vyasadeva saw this is not good for the world situation. The, the lack of goodness, people's impatience and earnestness. He could see many other signs of the influence of the age of Kali. For example, the cows would give very less milk. Previously, they would give much more milk. But to, nowadays, we get very little milk from the cow. Because we are so godless, impious and irreligious. We don't have love. The cow lives in fear that we're going to kill it, so they don't give much milk. Not only do the cows not give much milk, but the, the land does not grow much grain, and the qualities of the grains are also much reduced as we go on in the Kali Yuga. And because of the mode of passion and because of the influence of the Kali Yuga, Farmers 
farming has become a, a business, an industry, like an industry, and they will do whatever they can to produce the maximum quantity without caring about the quality. So they use so many fertilizers and chemicals and, uh, and then also uh, some insecticides, they will spray with different poisons as well. And then nowadays we have also the genetically modified seeds, so many things. This is the influence of the age of Kali. So Vyasadev saw all this, he was very conscious of all this, and he felt very depressed thinking about this. He could see people had so little faith, and he thought how to help them. That not, not only you know, Srila Vyasadeva is not just simply thinking about the Brahmanas, but he's thinking about everyone. Because he knows also in Kali Yuga hardly there are Brahmanas. So his, he wanted to be, help everyone, to help all the people in this age of Kali. So he, he, he tried to simplify the process of religion. It's explained in the chapter how initially there was one Veda, he divided it into four, and he gave each of the four parts to different disciples, and they were expected to teach that knowledge. Then, the, after the four Vedas, there was the fifth Veda in the form of the Mahabharata and the Puranas. Of course, the Mahabharata and the Puranas is not so much appreciated by the Vaishnavas. Uh, by, uh, by, well, this Mahabharata, Jiva Goswami, for example, he said, no one gets love of God simply from Mahabharata. But still, it, it's an important book to read, and we can learn a lot the, about the cultural, the cultural background, the nature of civilization at that time. It's helpful for us to hear the Mahabharata. And then Puranas are there, they're different. The Puranas are histories, right? Records of his, uh, his, what happened in the past. So all of these different books were given to the different disciples of Srila Vyasadeva, learned scholars, disciples and grand disciples. They were all given responsibility. And Srila Vyasadeva wanted these to be taught to everyone, even the less intelligent people, like the women and the sudras, like in Kali Yuga, where so many sudras, we're all sudra and lore. So Srila Vyasadeva thought about us and he wrote Mahabharata and everything. So this is all described in this chapter. But we hear that Srila Vyasadeva's mind was not satisfied. Although he was thinking about the welfare of all the people, but still he was not satisfied. We should understand this is the nature of material activities. That doesn't matter what level of material activity you perform, but some material activity, it won't give us that ultimate satisfaction, it won't satisfy the soul. One's activities have to come to the spiritual platform. So Srila Vyasadeva began to think what was wrong, he reflected about it, he began, he was thinking, what did I do wrong? And he thought, maybe, you know, no, he thought all the things, he thought, well, what have I done? I've, I've, I've practiced very strictly all the vows, I, did, I didn't break any principles, I worshipped the Vedas, I worshipped the spiritual teachers, everything, I did all the sacred yagyas, I did everything I was supposed to do, 
I wrote all these the different books for the, the different people. But still I don't feel complete. Something's myth missing. So what is wrong? Of course, he thinks about it, he said, I did not specifically, I didn't emphasize the importance of devotional service. And I know devotional service is very important. It's very important for the, the perfect beings and it's very important to Krishna also. Devotional service should be taught to people. So it was at this time that Narada Muni appears and he's ready to instruct Srila Vyasadeva. Because it's the nature of the spiritual master that he can understand the problems of the disciple and he comes to the disciple to offer some guidance there. So like this we hear in this chapter, Narada Muni, he comes to Krishna Vaipak, comes to Vyasadeva's ashram there at some prashna and Badrik ashram. Narada Muni comes there. Kali Yuga he doesn't come there. But this is just before Kali Yuga beginning. So Narada Muni's come there and Srila Vyasadeva sees his guru. Vyasa is the disciple of Narada Muni and so he sees his guru, he stands up and he is ready to give his respects and take instruction from Narada Muni. So this is a brief summary of this chapter. It's a very chapter, not much philosophical points. We will stop and ask if there's any questions. Guru Maharaj, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, in the beginning of the class, you mentioned that in the beginning you mentioned that for Srimad Bhagavatam, the qualification of the speaker is as important as the qualification of the listener. So could you uh, describe a little bit more about the qualifications of the speaker and the listener? Yes. I'm sure you can understand this yourself as a teacher, lecturing yourself as you do. You know, sometimes you have students who are really not up to it, not very good very difficult to teach them. But when you get some good students, you know, they can pick up the points very quickly, they can grasp everything. So, similarly on the spiritual platform with the transmission of spiritual knowledge, it's important that both the speaker and the audience have to be qualified. The speaker's qualification is that he's studied the matter, He's not only studied the subject matter himself, but he, can pr he practices it also, and he can present it for others. In Bhagavad Gita, this, this point is made in the famous verse in the fourth chapter, 34 verse. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadeshanti te jnanam jnaninas tatvadarshana. The qualification of the speaker is not only that he knows the truth, but he can also present it, he can show it to others. Sometimes you get speakers who will say, well, I know the truth, but I just can't put it in words. <laughs> so they say, I know the truth, but I can't tell you because I'm not able to explain it, I'm not able to put it into words. So that's not complete understanding. One who is actually the qualified teacher, not only do they know the subject, not only have they learned it, but they can also explain it to others, to show it to them. Of course, they, they, will, have, they will explain it according to the level of the, the audience to understand. Just like Prabhupada coming to the West, he was speaking to people who were unfamiliar with the culture. So he had to speak in basic language to present everything. So the audience, their qualification is, their main qualification is that they're eager to hear. They're very willing to be attentive and to hear carefully.
That is a qualification. Not that the audience have to be greatly learned or great scholars or anything, but the important qualification of the audience is that they want to hear and they're willing to give their full attention to hear. Then they can understand nicely. Is it clear? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, this one I think the uh, question is more on chapter 5, but I have this doubt uh, laid it off. Uh, basically, the Bhagavadam, before the Bhagavadam was written, the Vedas was um, divided into four, and uh, and um, and also uh, all the Puranas, uh, and also being prophets, uh, being, uh, the, he being given to five professors, stand up, like the Yajur Veda taken by Vyasadevi himself, and uh, Puranas taken by Aroma, Shana, and Pailamuni, Angira Muni, and so on. Uh, it, uh, this, because of this, a lot of deviation happens in current um, following of this uh, Vedic life, uh, because it was like uh, spread in the very, very different, different sampradayas, different schools, and we have a lot of deviation now, which is uh, not recommended by Narada Muni after that. But do you think because of this, we have a lot of deviation now in the various scriptures, the followings? Well, certainly there will be differences, different sampradayas, different lines of the cyclic succession. They will have some variations in following. But the purpose it should be the same. Just like Prabhupada explains how there are four different Vaishnava sampradayas, so Although they have different understandings, so, you know, they don't all accept Krishna as the supreme absolute truth. For example, Ramanuja, they, they see Vishnu as the supreme and Krishna as an avatar. But all the Vaishnava Sampradayas are clear that the living entity is the servant of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada, that is the important point. that. They're distinct from the Mayavadis, from the impersonalists, who claim the oneness of the living entity with the Supreme. In the Vaishnava Sampradayas, they see the distinction between the Lord and the living entity. The Lord may be Vishnu or he may be Krishna, but he's the master, and the living entity never becomes God. He's always the servant. The relationship is always like that the master and the servant. And so similarly, in understanding the Vedas, now there may be different conclusions. We see different sections of the Vedas emphasize different topics. And so that, that naturally there will be some differences there. there re somebody's reading the Rig Veda and somebody's more in the Sama Veda and different sections of the Vedas. In Brahma Samhita, as described by Lord Brahma, Vedishu Durlabham, that it's very difficult to know Krishna from the Vedas. But Adurlabhatma Bhakto, from the devotee then we can know Krishna very easily. So in the Kali Yuga especially, we don't give so much importance to the Vedic recitation, to just simply the Vedic rituals, right? Uh, the just simply mouthing the Vedas as it's described in Bhagavad Gita. The, this is not very good. Simply mouth the Vedas. We should know the purpose behind the Vedas. That's important. And so often people may be reciting the Vedas and they're reciting different ways different hymns, so many Vedic mantras, but they don't know the purpose behind the Vedas. So the Puranas explain clearly the purpose behind the Vedas. So in the Kali Yuga, the Puranas are given more importance than the Vedas. And the Vedic, the, all the Vaishnava Acharyas, they give good importance to the Puranic literature.
and we see also Lord Chaitanya, although there were some uh, differences between the different sampradayas, Lord Chaitanya attempted to bring the sampradayas together and he took elements from each of the four sampradayas and brought them into one sampradaya in the form of his Gaudiya sampradaya, the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya sampradaya. He took elements from each of the, the main elements from each of the four sampradayas. He brought them together into one, into his Gaudiya Vaishnava sampradaya. Just like in Ramanuja sampradaya, Lord Chaitanya took the main of uh, serving the Vaishnavas and the importance of pure devotion without desire for fruitive activities or liberation. And from the uh, Manva Sampradaya, he took the element about the complete refutal of Mayavadi philosophy and also the importance of the worship of the deity worshipping the deity in the proper manner as a, not just simply an idol, not just simply a ritual, but as a person. So like this, Lord Chaitanya took elements from each of the four sampradayas and brought them into his Gaudiya Vaishnava sampradaya to try to bring the sampradayas together. They could work together. And if you go in the light of the Bhagavad, Prabhupada explains how there's a need in the Kali Yuga for all of the different spiritualists of all the different organizations and different movements, that they should all come together and they should all preach and, and propagate the importance of uh, spirituality and having some spiritual aspect in life. It's very important in the Kali Yuga, particularly we want to emphasize the chanting of the Holy Name of God. So we can, as Lord Chaitanya said, you can chant any name, right? Not only Krishna's name, you, say, you can chant any name of God. Of course, different names have different potencies. But generally, we encourage everyone, chant the holy name, chant some name of God. So like this, we try to bring humanity together, and to bring more harmony, more unity, more cooperation seeing the unity, trying to unite society, not to divide it. So Srila Vyasadeva, by dividing the Vedas and giving different sections of the Vedas to different people, uh -huh. the, the intention was to make it easier for people not to make it more difficult. Of course, there's always a problem that in course of time, things will change, that people change things. Just like we see in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes in the fourth chapter that, and the, he said, I give the knowledge to the Sun God, the Sun God gave it to Vivishwan, Vivishwan, uh, the Sun God Vivishwan gave it to Manu, Manu to Ikshvaku, and the knowledge came to the saintly kings, but in course of time, the knowledge was lost. Why was the knowledge lost? Because it all got changed. So Srila Prabhupada often emphasized to us, don't change anything. We don't want to, you know, sometimes people say, oh, four rounds is too much. If we just have our, our four, four principles is too much, 16 rounds is too much, but Prabhupada said, don't change anything. If we have three principles, then there will be no pure devotees. Somebody told me, why chant 16 rounds? If we just have to chant one or two rounds, I can do one or two rounds, good rounds, but 16 rounds too much. But Prabhupada said, no, you must chant at least 16 rounds, minimum. And if we don't chant 16 rounds, then it will be very difficult to come up to Krishna, to the level of Krishna consciousness. So we have to understand the importance of Prabhupada's teaching, not to change anything. Hare Krishna. 
Any other question? Yeah? Guru Maharaj? Yeah. yeah. Uh, regarding the first question, right, I just wanted to check with you. Uh, sometimes we have speakers, sometimes when, when someone speaks Bhagavadam, they tend to, uh, if, if they tend to want to, they don't follow exactly the mood of the Bhagavadam. They sometimes may have their own vested interest. They want to pass a particular point uh, which has nothing to do with the Bhagavadam. Maybe they try to politicize it or something like that. Uh, these kind of people, when they give Bhagavatam, uh, though though they may uh, try to give it in in, in in the guise of devotees, uh, do we still hear from such people? Because I've heard that sometimes lips, uh, when when you hear Bhagavatam, like just like how the snake, uh, when milk is tasted by the snake, it is considered poisonous. So is that the mood we accept, or do we see that anyone who speaks Bhagavadam, as long as they speak about the glorification of the Supreme, we just listen to that? Yeah, generally the principle in speaking Srimad Bhagavatam is we want to discuss the principles of Bhagavad philosophy. It may be glorification of the Supreme Lord, it may be glorification of his devotees, or it may be glorification or just explanations of the process of bhakti. So, Srimad Bhagavatam is meant for discussing these things. It, it should be also uh, presenting the teachings of a previous acharyas. We want to present the philosophy based on whatever we have heard from reliable authorities, meaning Srila Prabhupada and those in the line of disciplic succession. We don't want to speculate and bring in our own philosophy, any new ideas like that, that's not required. We just have to present what we have heard from the other, from the higher authorities, from the previous acharyas. And we should be presenting that. So somebody may be presenting some ideas, some points which you may consider to be his own uh, vendetta or his own particular, mot uh, some motivated points. But you can always bring it back to the teachings of the acharyas. Everything has to be seen in relation to the instructions of Srila Prabhupada. We can't go away from Srila Prabhupada's teachings, right? He's given us everything. If you ever get a chance to look over Tamal Krishna Goswami's PhD thesis, one of the points which he makes is that he said, in doing re because he was doing research on Srila Prabhupada's teachings, and he said, there's no problem in shortage of information when you start looking at Srila Prabhupada's teachings. The problem is there's just so much of it. There's just so many recordings, so many lectures, so many books, so many letters. There's so much to be considered. So, you know, you may consider somebody has got some motivation or something, but it may be in relation to some point which Srila Prabhupada has discussed. Ultimately, it must all be in relation to Krishna. If it's not in relation to devotional service, then it's not part of our Bhagavatam. Right? Srimad Bhagavatam is for discussing service to Krishna. So, somebody may talk something you may feel not appropriate. You can bring it back. You're in the audience. You can put a question which is more related to devotional service. The audience also have a duty. They have a duty to inspire the speaker, to encourage the speaker to speak on Krishna consciousness. Consciousness. Then you put a Krishna conscious question to him, to bring him back to the topic which you think will be more relishable and more suitable for Srimad Bhagavatam class. So that's an important point to understand. The duty of the audience. You may know the topic, you may know the answers, but still you can put... 
and to bring the speaker back to topics which you think will be more relishable and more important. Okay? Is that all right? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. The, Any other questions from anyone else? Okay, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to address all Malaysian devotees. I know you're all, uh, you're, all uh, you're, you're on isolation, right? You're in house, you're staying at home these days. So, we're doing the same thing also here in Mayapur. Everyone's staying, staying back. Staying in. So you, you'll be like this until the end of the month, right? Until 28th? Yes, Guru Maharaj, they are extending it until the end of the month. Okay. And uh, after that, they will review the situation again. Okay, so so I have another... How, how, about, India? Huh? how, in, how about India? They are extending it also, right? Well, we don't know yet. They haven't, Modi hasn't said anything, but it's a good chance. <laughs> a good chance. Okay. We'll have to wait and see. There's only a few more days left. 21, <laughs> the 21 days is almost expired. I think there's three more days. So we'll find out. Uh, how's, things in, how, how's things in Mayapur, Guru Maharaj? Is, uh, are the devotees okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Devotees are fine here. <laughs> who, who wouldn't be fine in Mayapur? Good to hear, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, devotees are, they, they do, not many are allowed into the temple, only the pujaris are allowed into the temple room. But there's a lot going on, the devotees, you can hear the kirtan, they do a lot of kirtan, morning, noon and night, they have kirtan. And a lot of classes also going on, people giving lectures to them. So they keep busy. <laughs> Most of the devotees here just now, they're brahmacharis, they're sankirtan devotees. They're all sankirtan devotees, so they're, they're happy to be back here, and to be in the temple, to be together, and they have good association. Sannyasis, Jaipataka Maharaj is giving class online every evening. So, like that, devotees take a, they're, they're getting a lot of hearing and chanting done. Mm. Great. So, Guru Maharaj, take care of yourself, Guru Maharaj. Uh, we all are praying for you as well. Oh, thank uh, you. I'm begin. I'm going to be, be giving bhakti or oh, the the class on uh, Upadeshamrita beginning tomorrow, beginning here twelve thirty to two twelve thirty until two. I'm giving to the devotees here beginning tomorrow. They want me to give class every midday. Keep them busy. Uh, are you doing this uh, using Facebook? Yeah, I'll put it on Facebook. I'll, I'll see. It's, it's going to probably on Mayapur TV also. Because I'll, I'll do it over in the temple room. Mayapur TV you can watch. Oh, okay. Alright, so it's 12.30 to 2, is it? Yeah, in India time. Uh -huh. This is for how many days? Well, I'll finish the book. And go through the book. A verse a day, uh, you know, and see how it goes. Take, a, take me a couple of weeks, probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alright. That's nice. So if you have time, you can look in. Okay. So, Maharaj, yeah. The devotees are the devotees are giving their pranams. Uh, I think you can see in the chat. Uh, some of them, many of them, are, are giving their pranams and thanking Guru Maharaj for the class and everything. Okay. So I, I'm thinking uh, next next week if we can. Do you think you can continue with uh, chapter five on Srimad Bhagavatam? Yeah. Uh, that we were thinking of doing it on Saturday because Sunday apparently at night it's prime time, so there's a lot of things going on. So, if we shift it to Saturday evening, is that fine with you, Guru Maharaj? Oh. Uh, 
that might be a little difficult for me. I'll, I'll look into it and let you know. Because last, okay. last, last night I gave class to China. Last night I was giving class to China at that time. Yeah. But I'll look into okay, it. Okay, never mind then. I will just check with everyone and then I'll let you know. I'll, I'll look into it. Maybe I can change it to another evening. Okay. Okay, Prabhu. Thank Hare. you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare. Please accept my humble opinion. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Bancha Kaupa. Okay, take care. Ananta Koti Vaishnava. Rinde ki jai, Shri Lopu Bhaj ki jai.